unforgettable though near or far like a song of love that clings to me how the thought of you does sing to me never before has someone been more unforgettable in every way and forevermore that's how you stay hey ladies and gentlemen it's big daddy here at my secret hideaway you know i'm in hiding we had to blindfold Harry White to get him here to do this show. And uh, so what's going on, Harry? Uh, not too much. i got to ask you, what was the significance of playing that uh, song while the programs were running? Unforgettable by Nat King Cole? Oh, that's easy. Nat King Cole was, was a favorite entertainer of my favorite wrestler ever, Buddy Rogers, who was also unforgettable. As unforgettable as all the wrestling at the Keel and wrestling at the Chase was in this town, Harry. Well, you got it that right. Uh, all of it was unforgettable. And don't forget right. South Broadway Wrestling. A match That's in right. December, a match in January, a match every month. Don't forget Chuck Norman's uh, party for handicapped children. All proceeds go to handicapped children. Right. I won't be there this year because the I'm in hiding. December 20th at the Clarion. So, I won't be there. I'm still in hiding, Harry. We had to blindfold because we don't want nobody knowing. I know you would snitch. Buddy Rogers was your favorite, right? Oh, my all-time favorite. I got autographed pictures of him and everything. He's my a close personal friend of mine also. Well, you know, my favorite was the ultimate good guy, Pat O'Connor, you know. Pat O'Connor, he ain't nothing. Listen, my guy, my good guy, Buddy Rogers, beat your guy, Pat O'Connor. And let me tell you something, Harry. I got the film to prove it. Are you going to make me watch that again? You bet I am. Boy, O'Connor putting every ounce of strength and all his energy behind those vicious blows. And believe you me, if Rogers wasn't in superb physical condition, he would be out, and it looks like he's out on his feet. He manages to bring his knee up. Watch it now. One, two. He's having difficulty navigating. in the world today, Buddy Rogers. Not champion. one of them, the most colorful. The greatest wrestling that wrestling's ever had come out of this body. I want you and everyone listening in to know one thing, that if he ever made another guy better than me, he hasn't been, be he hasn't been made yet. The good Lord made me, he threw them all the way when it comes to the wrestling business. I've got a lot of imitators, many imitators. But there'll never be another to duplicate me. Champ, the fans have just seen you in a very tough match. How did, how did the match go? To, to well, I'll admit it was a little rugged. But like I've always told everyone, in and out of the wrestling business, when it gets too tough for everyone else, it's just right for Buddy Rogers. That's why I'm champ today. Buddy, you've got a lot of fellows claiming this title. Well, there might be a lot of claimants, but the public knows who the real champion is. They know when they look at Rogers. They're looking at the real diamond, the greatest diamond wrestling ever had. Hi to St. Louis, buddy. Hi, everybody in St. Louis. I Old sure St. miss Louis. you guys. You're one town I always loved to wrestle in. I wrestled there for Tom Pex, later on for Sam Muchnick, and I really miss you. To me, wrestling in St. Louis was always the greatest in the country. 
Big Daddy, he's his own man. If he has any inspiration at all in the business, it's Bobby Davis and the Nature Boy, Buddy Rogers. Next time, thanks. Thing, uh, little trivia piece that people are wondering, where is it that the name Nature Boy originated? Well, in 1947, I wrestled in Hollywood Legion Stadium, which today I believe is looked upon as a health spa or health club, what have you. And uh, I just come from Galveston, Texas, and I had a superb tan. And it was around the time that Nat King Cole brought out that song, Nature Boy. Well, when I opened up this white Neal robe I had, the audience just automatically screamed, Nature Boy. And after that evening, the fellow I beat the next day in the newspaper, the newspaper, the newspaper writers picked up on the Nature Boy, and they said, Buddy Nature Boy Rogers defeats whoever I wrestled. And uh, from that time on, it stuck, and I'm very happy it did. It was good for me, I was good to it. Many guys have tried to emulate me, and Ric Flair is one of them, Buddy Landell's the other, and I always feel that imitation is, or emulation is the greatest form of flattery. So I'm happy I was the first nature boy. Ah, all right, all right, I told you, Harry White, you've seen it. Buddy Rogers beat Pat O'Connor up. Took the title, wasn't nothing to it, man. Wasn't nothing to it. All right. I know I love watching that, but I'm gonna make you watch it again real soon. All right, I'll give you that one. But my other favorite, Luthez, beat your favorite, Buddy Rogers. But now well, you're gonna come back, I know, and you say know it. your favorite, Gene Kaniski, beat my favorite, Luthez, for the title. That's right, he did. I'll come back and say, well, my other favorite, Dory Funk, beat your favorite, Gene Kaniski, nah, for the title. Well, everybody loses, and then, and then I know. who beat Dory Funk? Well, I know, your favorite, Harley Race. Harley Race, handsome Harley Race, that's right. But then my favorite, Jack Briscoe, beat your favorite. Jack Briscoe, I don't even know who he is. I never heard of him before. I tell you what, people have seen us argue forever. Instead of watching us argue who's favorite, we'll let these other St. Louisans introduce the wrestlers. How about that? Harry, that's the best idea you had. That means I don't have to do no more on this show? That's about I'm that's glad That's the best to. idea you ever had. Take it away. Let him go. Hi, everybody. It's Joe Mama Mason from Kevin and Joe on 93.7 KSD. And I'm so glad that Harry White asked me to tell you about Pat O'Connor. Uh, my relationship with Pat O'Connor went way back to, I think, about 1980. Uh, I met Pat at a Rolling Stones listening party. He was introduced uh, uh, to me by a mutual friend of ours, Gene Donovich, who worked for CBS. And of all the strange places to meet the legend Pat O'Connor, uh, this party at the edge, uh, and it was for the Rolling Stones. And I just then I thought, who is that guy over there? He looks so familiar. I thought, maybe he's some kind of bodyguard for somebody. Uh, but it turned out to be Pat O'Connor. And we became friends quickly, and and what a gentleman! I just I could never say enough about Pat O'Connor because he was such a legend and so famous and so well known and had done so many things and traveled the world, yet was very humble. Uh, the man did charity work all the time, and then he come he used to come up to me backstage at Kila wrestling matches and he always grab my head and shake it like a peanut. Uh, not to be confused with his very famous wrestling hold. Uh, we have some pictures of Pat in here, in fact, and if you'll notice. Uh, this is an old St. Louis wrestling program, and oh, I'm sorry, that's that's not not that. That's oh, that's no, oh, that's never mind. Uh, here it is, anyway. The uh, in the ring and sports pointers. Uh, we have some old pictures of Pat, and the first one is from his uh, title match right here. There he is, Pat O'Connor, New Zealander, earns top spot on Keel Card, and this dates back to January 9th, uh, 1959. And that's pretty far back. That's when he won the title here. That's, that's when he won the title. And then he had a title rematch. And he had a title rematch with Dick Hutton. And that was on uh, January 23rd and from 1959. Of course, this was years before I was born, of course. <laughs> well, here we are, Joe Mama Mason, actually in my house. And I have to show you my prized possession and where I keep it. And I'm not kidding you. Of all the things that I own, I have... Uh, my two most prized possessions are a, an autographed picture from Groucho Marx, it says To Joe, but I do enjoy my book, Best Groucho. And this, which is what I'm about to show you, that I, Pat didn't give me, but it was one of his things that he left behind that uh, I wangled. 
Well, no, you didn't want to go. I think O'Connor's family wanted you to have O'Connor, it. O'Connor, so. okay, there you go. Pat's family maybe wanted me to have it, and uh, and I'm sure Pat would have too. Actually, he, I think we had we kind of hit it off. So come along, and I'll show you where it is. Uh, it's in the house, and it, like I said, this is something that Pat gave me, and uh, and in fact, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, and I and I keep it in a place of honor. This is the actual Pat O'Connor green jacket that Pat wore in the ring to his matches and uh, it is quite an honor to have it in my house and that's the only reason that I have an alarm here on the house <laughs> uh, just just to protect this because there are wrestling fans from all over the world not just the United States but all over the world that would do anything to have this jacket and they're not getting it and there is an alarm the size of which you've never seen before on this house just to save this jacket you know, Joe, Pat, Pat got cremated in his wrestling trunks, and it's too bad you couldn't pay off somebody at the crematorium to uh, get those wrestling trunks also. Well, I would have done it. I was, uh, I was there, and I saw Harry White and a couple of other people, Gene Zanonovich, at the memorial service in St. Louis for Pat O'Connor, and it was very sad, but uh, we remember Pat fondly, and uh, Pat, this one's for you. I've been uh, battered and bruised in most every town in the United States, and... Uh, you know, there comes to a time in your career when you've got to figure it out that that's time to hang them up. Oh, well. This is the third match of the evening. One fall in 20 minutes time for the referee is Lee Warren. Introducing from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, weighing 267 pounds, Al Canal from the Funny Bone Comedy Club. I have seen a lot of wild, strange, and unpredictable comics on this stage, but the most wildest, strangest, and craziest wrestler I've ever seen is Ox Baker. Ox Baker moved with the dreaded Hulk Punch. This was worse than eating five sticks of butter and drinking a gallon of olive oil. <sighs> Oh, 
up and run the shows. And they had a TV show at the Chase Hotel, and the fans were all there. And uh, I lost you. And he, oh, oh. I laughed at them fat women that went there and told them to go on a diet. And announcers, I ripped their ties up. Oh yeah, I, I made a nuisance out of myself, Ox Jr., but the fans, they loved it, they loved it. And the, the next few years, there was a lot of memories in there in St. Louis, and a couple of them I can uh, deal with. One night, Sam Musnick, who was a great promoter, oh, Sam Musnick, he used to yell at me and Dick the Bruiser, he said, hey, you two guys, you broke up six chairs, seven chairs, a table. That was before the bell rang, I can't understand. Dick DeBruyne was one of the great favorites of St. Louis of all times, and the people, oh, they hated me. I would tell them to sit down. Uh, the old women, I'd tell them to spit out their tobacco juice. And, oh, 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 me and Bobo get in there and say, Ox, stop calling me your black brother. And, oh, me and Bobo would pound on each other. And all in all, I just loved it. But this is a special night. He had Buddy Rogers, a special referee, and I think it was Gene Kaniski. Yeah, Gene Kaniski and... Dory Funk Jr. was out there, and they made some mood, and Buddy didn't like, and he raised his arm. He always had that beautiful tan, and he said, Stop that nonsense right now. And the crowd got hushed, and one guy said, Ooh, I wish Buddy Rogers we could see him one more time. And I said, What's so great about Buddy Rogers? He said, If you ever seen him, you've seen the best. He was the high spot king. And I did see him a few times after that, and Buddy was everything everybody had said, a great. St. Louis, a hey, me and Dick the Bruiser tearing things up. Pat O'Connor red in the face. He'd break a pencil and say, Ox, I'm telling you, why don't you learn a wrestling hold? You go out there and you kick and you gouge. I said, well, that's two holds, I know, uh, Pat. And everybody would laugh. But they'd have me there the next week. And uh, Sonny Myers, he was uh, a lot of greats in St. Louis. You know, it was a shame after a while, uh, another outfit came in there and nostalgia went out. Because in them days when we had a championship match, always sold out. That was Sam Mustang. When I need a sellout, I give them a world championship match here. And because the fans knew that they seen holds, they seen wrestling, and they would come there and they'd yell and they'd cheer. And of course, you know, they'd wait for me to come out there and come and say, I hope you get knocked down again. They like to knock me down uh, now stay steady now, you know. And uh, yeah, this little Ox Jr., my favorite wrestling doll, Harry White. And he also, Harry White, people of St. Louis, he wants me to do one thing. He wants to call me at my home here in Connecticut. Me and Peggy Ann live here in Lebanon, Connecticut. He wants to call me here some night and talk to the wrestling fans of St. Louis. And what I've told him, I've told him on this tape, uh, I want to talk to the wrestling fans of St. Louis because the fans themselves is what makes the wrestling. They come there and they cheer us and they boo us and they love us and they hate us and they like to see us knocked down and they like to see my famous heart punch throw I beat up many a man of course but the fans always came to see wrestling in St. Louis and if you have some wrestling questions cause I got this photogenic mind in the last 25 years I've got so many stories of St. Louis that I want to share with you people. That I can't do it on a three-minute tape, you know. But me and Ox Jr. are going to sit here the rest of the afternoon. We're going to talk about old things. You know, he wants to know why I didn't make me a wrestling doll with Ox Baker. But in reality, there's only one Ox Baker. And a wrestling talking doll would be a great thing. But it's better just to listen to Ox Baker. I want to tell all your fans there, whether you like me or whether you hated me, you never forgot Ox Baker. Hi, this is Tom Wheatley, the Post Dispatch and co host. You know, growing up in Pittsburgh, uh, before there was Hulkamania, there was Bruno Mania. Bruno San Martino, the star of uh, what they call it, uh, Studio Wrestling, I believe it was, with Ringside Rosie, the number one fan, and the crack referee Izzy Moydell, who never seemed to see all the uh, dastardly deeds going on. And Bruno was quite the hero. In Pittsburgh, any time he wrestled on a card, it meant that only Bob Euchre seats were available. Uh, his string of sellouts at Madison Square Garden and everywhere else uh, along the East Coast will never be equal. Because of politics, the great Bruno only once challenged for the NWA title. No other city could put on this memorable one-time, once-in-a-lifetime match. Harley Race versus Bruno San Martino. Lou Fez as the referee. They couldn't get Izzy Moydell, apparently. Only in St. Louis, only with Sam Munchnik. 
what was it, a one-hour draw, Harry? I wasn't here for that one, but I'll tell you what, Bruno was the guy as far as wrestling goes. Number two would have to be Jumpin' Johnny DeFazio, the uh, wrestling steel worker from Pittsburgh, but big Bruno, number one, a class act and a great champion. Again, we're back here with Bruno San Martino. Bruno San Martino, beloved all over the world, but especially in St. Louis for promoter Sam Munchnick. A series of super matches. He unmasked the invaders. Dick Murdoch had that classic, classic. That was the only time you wrestled for the uh, NW title against Harley. That's Harley right. Race. Yep. And St. Louis loves you. Can you say anything to your fans in St. Louis? Well, I will say that because I was WWF champion, I didn't have all the all that many opportunities, but I did wrestle in St. Louis maybe a dozen times. And and I had some great matches, uh, of course the one with Harley Race went one hour, and it was a great match I thought, but I like to tell the people of St. Louis that the promoter there was Sam Mushnick. This is a man that I have great respect for, he was a great promoter, he was a guy who, and I wrestled all over the world, he was a guy that when he contacted me to come to wrestle in St. Louis, uh, he, he was always a first class guy, if he made a deal with you, a handshake, it was, it was, it was fine, because uh, uh, he was a man of his word. Uh, he, he, he was just a class act. And amongst uh, many of the promoters that I've ever known in my career, I like to say, Sam, you're a class act. And it was a privilege to have wrestled for you. And I wish you nothing but the best and a long, long and healthy life. Hey, Rick, you ready? Come on, let's. <coughs> yeah, hi. Jeez. Uh, Rick Wallace, the. Uh congenial host along with Jay Randolph Jr. of the starting line every Monday through Friday morning from 6 till 9 on Sports 1380 KASP. I have right here, geez, I didn't know that spit take was going to uh, fly all over the place. Anyway, I have here the Missouri title belt, probably the most famous heavyweight wrestling title belt, most famous in the world probably. You, you talk about some great people who have worn this belt over the years. Eight different world champions, some of the biggest names. I got some of these names written down here. This reads like a hall of fame of wrestling. People that have worn the Missouri belt. Johnny Valentine, the old arm and hammer. Harley Race, maybe my favorite wrestler of all time. This guy was a true champion, a true champion. Terry Funk, Gene Kaniski, Sky and Brian McKenna, I don't remember him. Dory Funk. Bob Backlund. He was a true wrestler. He was a great one. Jack Briscoe, another great wrestler. The awesome one, Earl Austin Jr. I've heard that name before. Dick Slater, Ted DiBiase, who is still wrestling these days. Uh, look at these names. Dirty Dickie Murdoch from Waxahachie, Texas. This guy I thought was the epitome of the, the dirty wrestler. I saw him one night after a wrestling card at Ruggieri's restaurant. And uh, I was in there eating. Dirty Dickie Murdoch was like at the next table eating. And he's like shoveling it in like it's, you know, his last meal and food's flying out of his mouth. And he was just as disgusting out of the ring as he was in the ring. David Von Erich, the nature boy. Woo! Ric Flair, former Missouri champion. Kevin Von Erich. Ken Patera. This guy was uh, was an animal. I mean, he was, uh, he was great. Kerry Von a Erich. Crusher Blackwell, and of course, who could forget the one and only Dick the Bruiser, Dick Athless, who was Missouri champion a, a couple of times, I think. He was uh, one of the all-time greats. If only this belt, if only this belt could talk, it would say, man, time for a shower. But it would also, uh, well, it would have some great stories to tell. And you can hear some of these stories from time to time on Sports 1380 on the starting line. We feature some of the great wrestlers of the past and uh, I'm very proud <coughs> very proud to be uh, holding this belt not not near but uh, holding this belt it's uh, you think about all the great people that have worn this belt the Missouri State Championship belt hi gals and guys Mad Maynard here with Jukebox 96 radio you know we deal in memories every Wednesday night at Generations on Limburg and Watson and also at Smiling Johannan's place every Sunday night what's it all about at the very end, it's all about memory, so we'll put it all together. This was a fabulous wrestling town in the fabulous 50s gone by, and we want to take you back. You remember the killer, Jerry Lee, from way back in those 50s? Well, here is the scourge of the wrestling mat in the 50s. Here he is.
<laughs> Let me zero scourge. in on this here. What's that say? Yeah, the, the scourge of the mat to face Luthez. The scourge Luthez. of mat returns to face Luthez Akil. Man, they were headliners back there when I was a kid, and they were idols of mine. So let's go back to the days gone by. Jerry Lee was the killer on the piano, but here is the scourge and the killer of the ring, Killer Kowalski. I don't know if some of these young people ever heard of me before, but I've made my mark in professional wrestling. I remember St. Louis real well. In fact, the man who really got me started took care of me was Sam Muchnick. Boy, I should. I'm back to the truth. I'm very, very grateful. But Sam led me along, talked to me, helped me realize what wrestling was about, what business was about, the most important thing. And uh, sometimes you learn things the hard way. But I have to say, I really enjoyed my career. I enjoyed it. If somebody, somebody, in fact, somebody asked me, if you were to live your life over again, what would you do? Well, I started becoming an electrical engineer. I interrupted my education, becoming a professional wrestler. The first big match in St. Louis area here was, believe it or not, was Fred Lassie. Guess what happened? I won. The first match I ever won in my life, Fred Blassie. Later on, I think he got angry at me because he became a real big, bigger, bigger star than, than anyone. But uh, we became friends. He was a villain, just like Killer Kowalski was a villain. Well, I look back, fond years, so I do it over again. Travel the world didn't cost me a dime. Every place I went, I was recognized, I was helped. And it was a ball. In fact, I'd like to do it over again. Action today is a little bit different. A little more hype, a little bit less wrestling. At the time, I did a lot of wrestling. I remember Luke Fez. I wrestled Luke Fez right here in St. Louis. The outcome, he beat the hell out of me. What do you expect? He was the world's champion, NWA world's champion. Held it for many, many years. Wrestled, I know, later, later on, I did wrestle Luke Fez again in Houston, Texas. For 90 straight minutes with a draw. I was a little older, a few weeks older, a little smarter, bigger, a little stronger. Anyway, I looked upon myself as being getting there. I was getting a little bit better. I'm, you know, looking back at my career in wrestling, I've had some wonderful times. Kowalski is six, seven. Weighs 275 pounds. He's known as one of the roughest and cruelest wrestlers in the sport. So this should really be something. And this place is really in an uproar. You can hardly hear yourself think in this Coliseum right now as Kowalski and Rogers. Boy, talk about rivalry between these two fellas and these two ripping. Fred Kohler finally matched them, and here they are in the Coliseum on Wrestling Champions. Well, so far, it's been all Kowalski. They've been at it about two minutes. And so far, it has been all Killer Kowalski. Hey, Marty Herman from the South County Funny Bone, where comedy rules. South County drinks gallons of bush beer, and every time somebody orders a bush beer, I remember the great bush beer commercials with Joe Garagiola and Tyro Miyake on the wrestling shows of the early 60s. Yeah, the early 60s when we watched those wrestling shows, me and my grandma sitting on her knee, me on one knee, a bush beer on the other. Bussy Bavarian, only two words of English that Tyro Miyake probably knew. Hey, Tyro Miyake and his partner, Kenji Shibuya, were the first bad boys tag team on Wrestling at Chase. The Japanese terrors, Kenji Shibuya and Tyro Miyake and Marty Herman. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the first star at Wrestling at the Chase, one of the main inventors at the kill, Kenji Shibuya. Say hi to St. Louis, Kenji. Well, it's a pleasure to say hi to St. Louis. He gave Joe Garagiola hell, and he probably is the South Broadway Athletic Club now. He gives Skip Myers and Tony Cotton Hurt Sam and Tell. One of the greatest ever in St. Louis. Still in great shape, still looking good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenji. 
Hi, hi, Elaine Beats, and I'm very pleased that one of the greatest athletes in America was actually from St. Louis. It's Marianne Kostecki. She went under the name of Penny Banner because most announcers had trouble with Kosteckis. She's a, including me, <laughs> she's a Rosati Kane girl, and uh, she went on to have a wrestling career of more than 20 years, including several world titles. She's retired now and living with her husband in North Carolina, but once an athlete, always an athlete. She's now with the Senior Olympics. Okay, that's Penny Banner we're talking about, my first pinup, and that was Elaine Beach from the Post Dispatch. Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> at the Collar Blair Alley Club. If you ever want to get pro wrestling, women back to South Broadway, the best athletes you can start with is St. Louis and Penny Banner. Say hi to St. Louis, Penny. Hi, St. Louis. I miss you. I come back every year and I love you. You wrestled many years at Keel Auditorium, right? Yes, I have. I think I was the first and the second set of girls that came in there when they opened up there. Keel Auditorium and the arena. The arena. And a great athlete from Rosada Kane High School. And I took my, my instructions in judo from the YWCA down on Locust Street when I was going to high school. Well, now wait a minute, I went to St. Francis and Sales Grade School and Holy Angels, 8th grade. Any tutors you want to plug also? No, everybody, hello, I miss you. One of the best athletes out of St. Louis, Penny Banner, and one of the best athletes out of East St. Louis was her husband, Johnny Weaver, right? Yes, that's right, we're still married. All right, thanks a lot, Penny, appreciate it. Thank you. A program note, don't forget to stop Broadway wrestling every month some of the wrestlers send in audio tapes instead of video tapes. On the Von Rosky audio tape, we'll be showing clips from a match at Keel with Harley Race and Terry Funk. On the Big Bill Miller and Gene Kaniski audio tapes, we'll be showing clips from an old timers battle royal from 1989 held in New Jersey. Should have been held in St. Louis with all the old St. Louis favorites on there. Kaniski, Kowalski, Thez O'Connor, Nick Bockwinkel, his father was born in St. Louis, Ray the Crippler Stevens, uh, Bobo Brazil, the flying Frenchman, Edouard Carpentier, the man who made Milwaukee famous, the Crusher, uh, Chief J. Strongbow, that famous uh, Indian wrestler from New Jersey, and uh, Mickey Garagiola's favorite wrestler, Dominic Danucci. So an old-timers battle royal clips. Now some people may scoff at that. You're not going to see a lot of wrestling as in most battle royals, and some people may scoff at an old-timers battle royal, but hey, get together a bunch of 60 or 65 year old relief pitchers or football linemen and see what kind of shape they're in. Don't forget that South Broadway every month. You're going to see some wild action down there. I'd like to thank KMOX for letting me use the clip of the Dick the Bruiser match that was aired on KMOX quite a few years ago. I'd like to thank WGNU for provocative uh, talk radio from Onion Harkin in the morning until Mark Cason at night. Thanks to your local cable access for airing great shows like Worldwide Magazine, Pro Wrestling with Big Daddy, Jock Talk, this one, and all the other ones. On with the show. If you have any questions about any of these things you're seeing tonight, you can give me a call. Harry White, Commissioner Harry White, 645-8446. 645-8446 for any of these info or old tapes or anything you want to ask about. Or call the Pro Wrestling and Worldwide Magazine hotline, 879-3002. 879-3002. Smash here from KC95. I met Dick the Bruiser about 1977. I always used to watch him on TV as a kid in Indianapolis. I met him. He was in the dunk tank next to me. We were doing a celebrity thing. I was working radio in Indianapolis. That's where I met him. We got to be friends with him. Got to be real good friends with him. He used to take me down to Brown County, Indiana. We'd ride, ride dirt bikes together. And one night he took me down there and we went out to the middle of this forest and he captured a raccoon. He had bandoleros with bullets and he had holsters with guns on both sides and I was scared out of my ass. And we caught this raccoon. And so he puts it in a box and he makes me hold this raccoon in the box in his Cadillac driving all the way back from Brown County, Indiana up to Indianapolis, Indiana. This raccoon is fighting to get out of this box. This raccoon, when he gets out of the box, is going to kill somebody. Bruiser's laughing <laughs> all the way back to Indianapolis. That was uh, one of the more frightening experiences I had with Dick the Bruiser. But he used to take me to the wrestling matches with him. He was a good guy and a very, very good friend of mine, as you might be able to tell by, by this. This is Dick the Bruiser, and I'm with the best KC morning crew and the you man that ever was in the vicinity of St. Louis in the morning especially. Oh, is it tough getting up in the morning, but with the KC Morning Crew, it's 
lovely. Uh, Dick? Yes? You, you forgot to mention my name. Who the hell are you? <laughs> I love Dick the Bruiser. He's, uh, I have to say, one of the few guys in wrestling who could start off as one of the most hated people in the art form take the same tactics and make himself the most beloved person in the art form and yet maintain his stance as the most dangerous wrestler in the business. Wayne St. Wayne, the most versatile man in wrestling. He's a wrestler, he's a wrestling artist, he's a wrestling poet, he's a wrestling street musician. Wayne St. Wayne. Street artist actually, hairy white guy. Thank you very much and good evening ladies and gentlemen and wrestling fans. Just looking over some nostalgia here. Wrestling programs from the St. Louis Wrestling Club from the early 60s, 1963 here. One particular headline caught my attention. The Bruiser, most hated wrestler. And he loves it. That's one of the things I always admired about Dick the Bruiser, a unique individual, a real flamboyant personality as opposed to the cartoon caricatures that we all know and love. Dick the Bruiser, it didn't matter to him whether you loved him or hated him. He did as he felt like doing. He, he did what he believed in. He was himself. Like it or don't like it. Dick the Bruiser. Also the subject of one of my all-time most fabulously brilliant, stunningly original paintings right here. The original ladies and gentlemen and wrestling fans as 24 by 30 inches of throbbing, convulsing color on canvas. Visuals and visions by Wayne St. Wayne, Dr. Blood. Friday night with Dick the Bruiser now on display at the lovely and talented Venice Cafe right here in St. Louis. I think the Venice won the rights to from the art museum to put that up, didn't they? I don't keep track of all that left brain <laughs> detailed stuff. I'm too busy creating great works of genius. Saint is not only my name, it's my occupation. Not only do I create works of great art, I am a work of great <laughs> art. Thank you. Yes, well, I mean, it's just not a, a thing that where he's always been nice to me. He really did do with Right down the line, and if I got chastised, I deserved it. So you got suspended for six months for breaking up a chair? Well, that and a few heads and a few people there on the front row. You got a face like a ripped softball, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> he's really taking some beatings in the ring, and he's handed out a few of his own. This match is all evened up. The stitching is drooping. He's so mad, he's... He's slamming his head into the corner of the ring rope. I think he's going to cry. Well, that's what you might call uh, flagellation. He's beating his body against the ropes to get his strength back. There's a fly drop kick, and the bruiser goes out of the ring. Fez is out of like a panther. He slaps him with an elbow, but the bruiser's retaliating. He tops Fez over the ropes. And they're battling outside the ring in front of our KMOX microphone on the apron right now. And Jack's got his hands ready to take the water. Now he's got the bruiser and he built his head against the ring pole. Two, three, four, five, six. He's out. Nice to the crowd. Listen to the crowd go out. Fez and Dick the Bruiser are still going at it. Fez and the Bruiser. In a wild melee in the center of the ring and foreign debris being thrown in the ring as the Bruiser works over to Fez as this match is already over. Lou Fez rammed Dick the Bruiser's head into one of the turnbuckles in the corner of the ring. And... Bruiser couldn't get back in there. And now all the help, two referees and one of the assistants in there, trying to keep Dick the Bruiser off, Lou says, Bobby Brown's assistant for Sam Mustard. The hand of Lou says is raised in victory in the fans' chair. Boy, that says really came after him. I am Dennis Barnage. I'm one of the sports editors with the Suburban Journals. We do a lot of uh, amateur sports coverage. Back in the uh, 60s, we would be doing uh, uh, stories on people like Jim Roschke, uh, a great high school wrestler, college wrestler, went on to become All-Army. Uh, at that point, he was still a good guy. Uh, he went on, became uh, one of the great bad guys, one of the uh, uh, truly despised humans in the wrestling world. Uh, went out as 
as Baron von Roschke, little known point, at one point he was the only uh, member of the German royal family to wrestle professionally. Uh, Baron von Roschke became known as uh, nothing less than uh, the most hated man in, uh, in six states, <laughs> tonic tear, uh, a truly despicable human. Uh, he had a rough and tumble style, uh, none of the uh, sissy scientific stuff for him. Uh, his death hold was, of course, the claw. Most people know that. Uh, he was one of the originators of, uh, of that. He's killed several people. <laughs> and, and was, uh, they considered making that illegal, uh, but Von Roschke uh, pucked them out of it. Uh, let me show you a, uh, a headline from uh, one of his featured matches. Uh, against another hated human, Dick Bruiser. And Zero this, in. This pretty much sums up his style. Let's see if we can get this here. Science goes out the window. It's rescue duels the Bruiser. Hope that shows. Dennis Barnage from the journals. The greatest experiences I've ever had. Met some of the biggest challenges I've ever had in professional wrestling. The old Keel Auditorium, it was one of my, became one of my very favorite places to wrestle. I always enjoyed coming to St. Louis, despite the weather, the humidity. I, sh I shouldn't really talk about weather, though. I live in Minnesota. We get some kind of funny weather up here, too. But uh, My first match there was with Pat O'Connor at NWA champion, great wrestler, very skilled technician, gave me a, just a tremendous bout. I enjoyed the challenge, and I later learned that he enjoyed the challenge of uh, wrestling with me. All the characters from the old days, Gene Kaniski, Johnny Valentine, Dory Funk Sr., Bob Geigel, Black Jack Lanza, Bobby Heenan, Dick the Bruiser, Harley Race. So many names, so much history. If you go back farther, I heard the stories, the stories of John Pesek. They go way, way back before my time, probably before most of your audience's time. Just great days in, in St. Louis. Especially great days in the Keel Auditorium. Great fans there, great supporters. Always enjoyed the fans in St. Louis. Hope to come back someday. Now I was. Uh, after college, I wrestled for two years in, in the Army. When I was drafted in the Army, they let me wrestle. Placed third in the world in Greco Roman wrestling. Made the Olympic team in 1964. Giving away my age now. Uh, shortly after that, I taught school for a year, and then I uh, went into professional wrestling under the guidance of Vern Gagne and eventually Mad Dog Bashan, which uh, nostalgia is great, but life goes on, and I'm in the middle of changing careers. I wish all my fans uh, the best of luck. All our wrestling fans everywhere the best of everything. And thank you, Harry. I hope your show's a big success. That is all you need to know. Hi, I'm Charlie Tuna, sports director of KETZ Radio. I can be heard each and every night, from 10 until 11. And on Sunday night, you can hear me from 9 to 10. Now, I'm also at KESP four mornings a week from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Bill Miller was a great college athlete, three sports, nine letters. It was a great pro wrestler. I'm telling you what, this guy was super. Also, whether you booed Bill Miller or not, you respected this guy. I mean, he was a great athlete. I get booed a lot, but at least people respect me. I don't give a damn anyway. Keel Auditorium was a great place to wrestle. Your wrestling promoter, Sam Muchnick, always had great wrestling cards. Please give my best regards to Sam and his family. I'll never forget when Sam had brought me into St. Louis as Dr. X and had told me to liven up the announcer Joe Garciella. 
Well, Joe had a toupee at that time, and in our meeting, a scuffle developed, and his, two, his toupee went flying. Joe was furious and said, if that masked man ever comes back to St. Louis, Sam would have to get another announcer. That was the end of Dr. X, and sometime later, the Crimson Knight returned to St. Louis. I can't remember if Joe Gargiola was still there or had gone on to better things minus his toupee. Harry, as you well know, many of my former opponents have taken the final count. I'm sure we all miss such characters as Dick the one and only Bruiser, Wilbur Snyder and Pat O'Connor, and others. Those were good times when we were all much younger and the world a safer place to raise your family. The drug problems and pollution problems were not so serious and widespread as they are now. The wrestling fans in St. Louis were probably the nicest and most considered I have ever met. Even though my roles were the villainous Crimson Knight and Dr. Big Bill Miller, the fans always treated me with respect. It would be nice to return to those 50s, 60s, and 70s, but time has a way of marching forward. So, at age 65 and retired from veterinary work, my wife Joanne and I spend most of our time caring for each other and visiting our six children and 13 grandchildren. Give my best regards to the fans of St. Louis and to any of my former opponents you may happen to contact. See you later. Dr. Big Bill Miller. I'm Herb Smith, representing the Arthritis Foundation. The Arthritis Foundation is the source of health and hope for an estimated 37 million Americans who have arthritis. Big Thunder Gene Kineski called himself Canada's greatest athlete. Gene's big move was the dreaded backbreaker. You know, I think that move alone probably raised the incidence of spinal arthritis in wrestlers all around the country. Who can forget Gene Kineski? And don't forget the Arthritis Foundation. The Arthritis Foundation for help and hope, call 644-3488, the Arthritis Foundation. I'm 63, I still think I'm glad to be this athlete. All right, that's what it takes, a great mind, and you had a great mindset to keep that NWA world title for almost four years, didn't you? I certainly did, that was a great day in my career when I defeated Lou Says uh, for the title, and if you recall, Lou Says is the local boy in St. Louis. I just have good, good memories of St. Louis. I'd have to sit in the capital of uh, the world. And then, of course, certainly have. And, of course, I have one regret about the way I earned a living. You know what that is? What could it be? I wish I could do it all over again. What a beautiful way to earn a living. Could you imagine people cheering and booing and making such a fine, beautiful living, being able to travel all over the world, not having any bosses and things like that? And like I said just a second ago, I wish I could do it all over again. Well, see you again because you uh, you wrestle everybody. You wrestle the good guys, the scientific guys, the rough, tough brawlers. You wrestle every style out there, didn't you? You name it, I wrestled. I was interested in one thing. That was uh, making a dollar. And as I said a thousand times, when you spent one dollar to see Kodiski, you got a ten dollar value. <laughs> well, the Kmart should uh, advertise that way. No, it's just going to do it. Don't give me the Kmart. <laughs> We're talking to us. And, uh, if you want to push one of your sponsors, do it your own time, not on mine. Okay. Uh, you used to beat up people in the ring pretty good, but I remember sometimes when the match would be over, you'd go up to the announcers. Uh, Joe Gergio and Mickey Gergio and Strip Irwin, you and all of them. Yes, yeah, they go so strange. Uh, we got to be uh, friends, but uh, I remember Joe Gergio years, years ago. I guess he figured he was a wrestler and he grabbed a hold of me. I said, I'd be the head of him. I said, hey, you're a little, you know, baseball player. And here I'm 200 and uh, about 75, 280 pounds. He's getting smart with me and they're making uh, uh, rude comments and remarks. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have hard violence. You know, violence is a tool of ignorance. But every once in a while, I let the wind of anger blow up the light of reason and I have to retaliate. And being a physical figure, I was going to take those uh, three individuals at different times to put over my knee and give them a good uh, a spanking, physically, as the one plus giving them a verbal uh, tongue lashing. Yeah, your verbal abuse was uh, one of the highlights of a Kaniski match. Uh. Right, 
beginning. I grudgingly acknowledge you as probably the best wrestling manager ever born in the Midwest. You're right about that. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. The greatest wrestling manager. Who do you think was the best athlete ever born in St. Louis and maybe the best wrestler ever? Well, I, I grudgingly have to say that it was probably Mr. Luthez, still alive and one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Yeah, he wrestled all over the world, wrestled for the Prime Minister of Japan and the Queen of England. Yeah, I know them too. The Prime Minister of Japan, oh yeah, he's, me and him are, Sakamoto, we and him are good buddies. And, oh. and the Queen, I know the Queen, we, we party all the time. That's right. St. Louis was once steeped in authentic wrestling many years ago, however. <laughs> Men like Ray Steele and George Saharias, Milo Steinborn, and so forth, other greats, Ed Stranger Lewis, and so forth, paved the way for men like Pat O'Connor, Buddy Rogers, Wilbur Snyder, Dick the Bruiser, Bill Longson, Bill Miller, Vern Gagne, Dick Hutton, Joe Millage, Ricky Starr, and others, including myself. We reap the harvest of the seeds that were sown by our generous forefathers. They were our mentors. Pat O'Connor was by far the best wrestler to originate in the Australian New Zealand area. He had the ability and the intestinal fortitude. He was a very colorful, one of the all-time greats. Uh, I had a very, a very tight relationship with uh, Pat. We wrestled each other many times, and uh, every time I wrestled him, why uh, uh, he he made me go to the limit and that's the way that's the way pat was uh after the bell rang he went all out and anyone that was ever in there with him knew they were in the contest so well buddy rogers without question buddy was the most innovative colorful performer i have ever known uh o'connor was a better mechanic as a wrestler <clears throat> but rogers outdrew all of us in cl crowd appeal no matter where he went <coughs> excuse me he would immediately do sellout business, which is the name of the game. <laughs> After all, that's what we're in there for, is to make a living. Wilbur Schneider. Wilbur could wrestle, play a great game of handball or tennis, love life, I think too well, maybe. <laughs> Dick the Bruiser. Uh, just that, a bruiser. He did not take the time to learn to wrestle, but did well due to his rough, tough style and uh, did very well, ended up as a promoter in Indianapolis and had mediocre success there. Uh, Bill Longson, a fighter that turned to wrestling from Salt Lake City, uh, had more pure guts than just about anyone I ever knew. Uh, Bill had a great, great track record and did very well throughout the world and uh, he left at an early age too, which was sort of a disappointment. I grew up in Japan, I'm just uh, digressing now, I'm, I'm getting in another another vein here, uh, called Universal Wrestling Federation International in Tokyo, are carefully making martial arts and wrestling matches of credibility. I am now working with the officers of the company to bring real wrestling back to the U.S. The general public, plus our wrestling fans, which I am one of, incidentally, are tired of the TV circus in the U.S. called pro wrestling. In recent years, I have really been ashamed uh, to be called a wrestler because I'm guilty by association by having had a wrestling background. But now with the UWFI, Universal Wrestling Federation International in Tokyo, presenting a bona fide contests, I am serving as an international matchmaker. That is my small contribution to my first love, wrestling. Harry, uh, thank you for permitting me to, uh, to tell the people what I really think. And my real hope is, of course, that we can uh, rejuvenate, uh, reincarnate the thing that we call wrestling. I want to thank you and Jack Buck and Harry, uh, Larry Matichek, Joe Garagiola, Mickey Garagiola, Sam Muchnick, Bob Bragg, Bob Burns, and all of my St. Louis friends for this opportunity to air some of my pent-up feelings. Feelings about wrestling, the thing that I really eat and sleep, of course. I know this is getting wordy, but my mentors like Ed Stranger Lewis, George Stragas, Joe Sanderson, Ray Steele, and so forth are listening. I hope you are. Thank you very much. 
Luthez versus Pat O'Connor was probably the finest scientific match ever held in St. Louis. Well, decades later, these two met again in the finals of an old-timers battle royal exhibition. Decades later, native St. Louis and Luthez against St. Louis resident Pat O'Connor. Check it out. Gentleman by the name of Luthez. So yes. You wrestled before. How would you describe him as a professional? Oh, fantastic. Uh, I uh, look back in the records that I had over the years that I had been in and out of St. Louis, I had wrestled him 12 times. And uh, we had stalemates. He had beaten me, and I'd beaten him. So, uh, you know, I don't know uh, what the true score was. But out of those 12 matches, I would say that uh, we, we'd spent uh, at least 10 hours in the ring. Mickey Garagiola did a great intro for Rip Hawk, but Rip Hawk's tape never showed up. You know, you got a little of Rip Hawk in you. Uh, hey, that's, that's Rip the Profile Hawk to you, Harry White, and I happen to know that Rick Hawk, Rip Hawk is down in Texas where he's teaching amateur wrestling and stuff, and he had great views. You know, it's strange you get Mickey to do that because Rip and Joe, his brother Joe Garagiola, used to get into it all the time. They were always heated up all the time. And, of course, Rip Hawk was always right. And I'm always wrong. That's exactly and Joe right. Was always wrong. That's exactly right. Harry White, you're wising up. You're getting smarter every day. I hate to say that, though. We didn't mention King Kong Bruiser Brody on the show because Big Daddy does a Brody special every year. You've seen that before. And we didn't mention, mention the great Sam Mushnet because we're having a big party for him coming up. We'll tell you more about that later. And Mr. St. Louis Wrestling, Larry Matisic, the most knowledgeable guy in the business. We all love him. That's the only thing Big Daddy and I agree upon. He's still active, and he's still the most knowledgeable man in wrestling. That's right. Is this show over, Harry? That's it. It's about time it's over. Tell him what, tell him what Big Daddy used to tell him all the time. You know what it is. Uh, Goodbye I... and good riddance. <laughs> what you are Unforgettable Though near or far Like a song of love that clings to me How the thought of you does things to me Never before has someone been more unforgettable in every way 
And forevermore That's how you stay That's why, darling It's incredible That someone so unforgettable Thinks that I am